on today's program. Do you realize the importance, TAC, of when your man of God stands behind this desk? Any man of God that he puts behind this desk and you don't respond, there is something that's going to fall in your lap. You better respond. You better get out of your seat and say, I know that's right. I know that's truth. Let that resurrect something on the inside of my heart. All that and more next on Today's Truth. Psalms chapter number 27, beginning in verse number 8. Just reading one passage of scripture tonight. The Bible says, When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Amen. Let us all pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, your word is forever anointed. Your word is forever settled. God, I ask that your anointing would rest upon me one more time. God, that I could speak unto your people. Let us leave this place being different than the way that we have came. Lord, let your word go forth and land on good ground in the precious name of Jesus. In the precious name of Jesus, Lord, we ask you to move in a mighty, mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. In the church, say amen. 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 If you can be seated, if you promise to help me. Amen. This is service number 28 for me this month, so my body is a little tired, but I need your help tonight, so... Amen. But located in South Minneapolis is a place called Orfield Laboratories. This place has a solitary room called the Anechoic Chamber. It's listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the quietest place on the face of the earth. It achieves this ultra silence by virtue of the fact that it has three foot acoustic fiberglass wedges in all directions of the room. While being attached to double-walled insulated steel, and on the outside of this steel is over two foot thick of concrete. They say silence is golden, but that is not really the case with the company's founder and president, Steve Orfield. In fact, this company has found out it is quite the opposite. This room is so silent that it becomes completely unbearable in just minutes. Until a few years ago, they would openly let people come in and sit down in this dark, silent room. According to the company's website, the longest anyone has ever lasted without going almost completely mad is about 45 minutes at the location in South Minneapolis. According to Steve Orfield, the only way to possibly stay any significant length of time is for you to sit down because it's the noise of walking around and standing and just normal life stuff that gives us our bearings to function. And as those sounds of life are taken away, per- perception becomes skewed and balance and movement become a near impossibility. They say due to the engineering feat of this room, it, is, it absorbs 99.9% of sound. And while that might sound like heaven to a busy and weary mother or some stressed out individual, you see the problem with staying in that kind of condition for too long, the body will start hallucinating. They say the silent... This silent room is the most uh, unnatural deception because from our own experiences, the quieter the room, the more things you are able to hear because your ears are adapting to your surroundings. Uh, But in this anechoic chamber, even though you didn't notice it beforehand, your heart starts sounding like it's going to pound uh, out of your chest. Uh, They say you can hear the capillaries in your lungs uh, pull apart as you are breathing. Uh, 
They say it seems like you are, you can hear the mucus being pushed around in your lungs while taking in a breath of fresh air. Testimonies from visitors say they heard their abdominal regions begin to gurgle so loudly that they were convinced that they had a severe problem to the point that they even went to a doctor after leaving this room. They say the most strange sound that they heard was the intestines trying to move the food from their stomach into their bowels. They say in the anechoic chamber that your own body becomes the sound that terrifies you because you've never noticed the sounds before. Ironically, the silence so negatively affects your own body that it whirls you into a place of disorientation and unbalance and even severe hallucinations. As I began to study about this anechoic chamber in South Minneapolis, Minnesota, they say the, the, the only saving grace are to the ones that has made it to the significant amount of time in this silent room. It was the rhythm and the beat of their own heart that helped them stave off hallucinations and disorientation because the natural noise of everyday life was taken away from them. But it was here their heart helped them stay alert and endure the silence. I need somebody to listen to this preacher today. I find it interesting that it was the heart that helped them keep their sanity and stave off deceptions and hallucinations. Now let me set the stage by saying I came here to preach more than just about the anechoic chamber in South Minneapolis. In fact, I want you I want to preach to you about the importance of your heart today. If you should live 70 years, your heart will beat a little over 2.52 billion times and yet that physical blood pumping machine is largely gone unnoticed and unconsidered. But when God speaks about a man and his heart, God is speaking more than just about a muscle pushing through your blood through your veins and arteries. In scripture, when it speaks about a man and his heart, it is translated into two different words. The first word is translated from the word labab, which strictly talks about the innermost organ that pushes blood through your body. But the other word is translated from the word leib, which means the center of your passions and your pursuit of God. It's talking church about your inner feelings and the spiritual intellect of who you are. I'm talking about your heart tonight. Well, does anybody got a heart that wants to pursue God? Does anybody got a heart that wants to see God move like you've never seen him move before? Does anybody got a heart that says, I want to see a hundred soul revival? I don't want to sit back and witness other miracles, but I want my own experience with God. come here to preach tonight about a silent heart a silent heart when the scripture talks about your heart it refers to the core of your consciousness it refers to the innermost voice of your soul I've got to remind someone today that your heart must have a voice that will speak to you when I look at the word of God church and the layout of scriptures I've come to see emphatically that our heart is supposed to speak to us time and time again we hear about the the heart of a man speaking it is expressing some innermost feeling it tells us about attitudes that we need to be checked it speaks about carnality that needs to be reined in does anybody know what I'm talking about today I find in Acts chapter 2 Simon Peter stood up and preached to them because he was so deeply moved by the spirit of God and scripture records that when he had heard when they had heard this they were all pricked in their hearts oh that means that they were so thoroughly pierced in the heart of their man that they had to get up 
and say, I've got to find that God that he is preaching about. I've got to find that God that so thoroughly convicted me in my carnality. I've got to find that God that he was talking about. That literally means they were so thoroughly pierced in their heart that the, until a response was made. Do you realize the importance, TAC, of when your man of God stands behind this desk? Any man of God that he puts behind this desk and you don't respond, there is something that's going to fall in your lap. When a man of God gets behind this desk and he's preaching what thus saith the word of God, you better respond. You better get out of your seat and say, I know that's right. I know that's truth. Let that resurrection on the inside of my heart oh hallelujah was the voice of their heart I thoroughly believe that one of the most powerful things that God has ever given an individual is a heart that still has a voice. God knew that the voice of your heart is so important that because in scripture I can find that the word heart is linked to the word said over 200 times in your Bible. It is in the terms of thou hast said in your heart or thou hast said unto me in your heart or my heart has said if it's those terms I want to speak about tonight when I survey the word of God and search about the heart speaking. I find I find it most interesting uh, that almost every time when the term is quoted uh, and he said in my heart, uh, it's almost always said uh, in two ways. Uh, it's in absolute sincerity uh, and honesty uh, or it's in total deception uh, or hypocrisy. Uh, it's either speaking from insincerity uh, or speaks from hypocrisy. Uh, for instance, David said uh, in our opening scripture uh, in Psalms 27, and eight when thou hast said seek my face my heart said unto thee thy face Lord will I seek it was a statement of true sincerity but when Jeroboam said in my heart those people will return unto the Lord if I don't do something to persuade them away it was an expression of absolute deception it was an expression of honesty when Solomon said in his heart I cannot give myself unto vanity but it was an expression of hidden hypocrisy when David spoke of when he said the evil man has said in his heart that God has forgotten I need you to listen to this preacher today your heart will either push you toward God or it will deceive you it will always depend on how you've allowed your heart to become fixed with hypocrisy it was an expression of, hypo of honesty when Jeremiah cried unto the Lord with his heart in Lamentations 2 18 let not the apple of his eye cease but it was a statement of hypocrisy when Satan said in his heart I will ascend my throne above the throne of God Almighty. Can I tell someone in this house today that one was the voice of honesty and the other was a voice of deception. Oh, someone in this house today, you better get that voice in your heart right. That voice will deceive you if you don't get in control on it. You better have a pure heart before the Lord. I've come to preach to each of us under the sound of my voice that the heart that it serves in the center of your soul when God designed you he designed you with a heart that has a voice that would move you closer to God it's a voice that speaks to you and says I need to let go of that I need to get closer to God I need to let go of carnality I need to let go of the world I need to let go of ungodliness it's a voice that will steer you back on the right path 
when you have strayed off the path of righteousness. Oh, does anybody understand what I'm preaching tonight? A heart that troubles you when sin is present in your world. A heart that causes sleepless nights when disobedience is present. A heart that still feels burdened for the loss. You must have a heart that speaks to you. The Bible speaks strongly about a pure heart. For Proverbs 4, 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it comes the issues of life. Hey, let me tell you something, TAC. God was saying, you better keep that heart tender. You better keep that heart tender. If Hollywood is causing you to harden your heart to the aspects of hell, you better let go of it. If the worldly pleasures is causing you to harden your heart to where preaching can't move you, you better find new hobbies. Come on, I'm at home. I'll say a little bit more than what I'm out preaching, but you better keep that heart tender to where the preached word of God can move you. It can convict you and say, I've got to keep my heart pure. I've got to keep my heart pure. July. July the 11th, my wife can testify to this. I was preaching at Brother Long's, Atkins, Arkansas. And July the 11th, I was preaching a reaching message for sinners, a reaching message for some backsliders, some young people back there about where Sister Candace is. Pastor Lee, in the middle of preaching, something encouraged me. I was preaching about the woman at the well, and that was totally encouraging. And how that you can get your life changed with just one encounter with Jesus. July the 11th, the middle of that message, closer to the end, all of a sudden, there was a spirit there, Pastor. I've never felt that before. I've never felt like that before in the middle of an encouragement message. God shift my spirit. And I started preaching conviction very, very hard. And I started reaching for them young people. Them young people, 16 to 18 years old. Pastor Lee, they sat there and they laughed at me. They sat there. They, they used to have the Holy Ghost pastor. But after a church split, they left. And they sat there and laughed at me. And they, they went and, and they told my wife. And then they talked to my wife. And my wife play, pleaded with them not to leave until they went to the altar. But guess what? That pastor texted me this morning. He said, hey, brother, you need to pray for that young man by the name of Zayden. They went to a party last night. And they had stuff mixed in their drinks and every one of them is in the ER and they don't know if they're going to live because their organs is shutting down. Hey, let me tell you something. You better keep a heart pure. You better keep a pure heart that says I can be moved. Hey, good pastor, don't have to push and prime me. I know I've got to have a pure heart. I've got to have a part that seeks after the Lord. I've got to have a heart The worst thing that can ever truly happen to a Christian is for the heart that God gave them to lead you closer to God. Become so spiritually carnal that you start believing the lies of that carnality because it's speaking deception into your world. It's vital today that you know it is very possible for your heart that 
thing that is supposed to lead you to God and closer to God. That core thing that is supposed to be honest and sincere can become so spiritually perverted that it lies to you and starts pulling you away from God and the man of God and from the church. Hey, 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 hey! Don't you understand that it don't you don't need the devil to walk away from God. All you need is a heart that has so become so silent on carnal issues, silent on fleshly desires, silent on unfaithfulness, silent on unholiness, silent on carnal things and carnal mindsets. Ladies and gentlemen, I need you to understand you got to have a tender heart. I've been evangelizing full time for almost two and a half years. September will be two years that the only dime that I've ever made is from preaching. And ladies and gentlemen, I've been around this apostolic doctrine my whole life. I've been in countless churches, preached revival, seen hundreds if not thousands filled with the Holy Ghost. But I'm going to tell you that you can see some hideous, atrocious things from people that have allowed their heart to deceive them. All because they've started believing the lies of their own heart. In fact, one of the most treacherous scriptures in all the Bible is the one that speaks about those that are lost for all of eternity because they have believed a lie and was damned. Let me tell you something, church, for you to truly believe something. It takes you to get your heart involved, for you to believe that you're okay with sin in your life. It takes a heart for you to believe that you're going to go to heaven without the infilling of the Holy Ghost. It's going to take your heart. You better have a tender heart, a pure heart. When you lower the standards of your heart, when you start allowing uncontrollable carnality to speak, even God says, I can't help that. You better hear this preacher tonight. I'm not here to play games. I'm not here to try to preach a fancy message. There's others that can do a lot better job. But you cannot afford your heart to become so deceitful. And that it starts lying to you about the sin in your life. And the consequences of disobedience to the word of God. Like I said, the Bible is quick to tell us to guard our heart. And keep our heart. But that same Bible. Bible is just as quick to tell us uh, that the heart is deceitful. And it's in your heart that has all wickedness. But my question today to this congregation is how does that tool, that thing that God placed in the center of your being to lead you and to guide you, to push you closer to God, How does that tool become so perverted that it starts deceiving you? Where does that begin? A once sincere, honest heart becomes deceptive and so so full of iniquity and so full of lies. At what point does that thing that once directed you to the ways of God starts directing you away from the ways of God? It's my observation in this apostolic way of life. That thing that leads you from a sincere heart to a deceptive lying heart is always found when they have a silent, a silent heart. That once, that once heart that heart that once said, hey, buddy, that girl ain't right for you. Hey, buddy, come on, I'll speak from a personal experience. Uh, hey, uh, hey, man, those websites, uh, if you keep scrolling down those, uh, they're going to lead you to a path uh, of destruction. Uh, well, why did you stay around that? 
It was because you allowed the carnality of your life to cause your heart to become so hardened that it became silent. When you stop keeping that heart tender, because of the choices you make it will always ultimately harden that heart until it becomes a silent heart those people whose heart was the driving mechanism that propelled them to an altar of change has now became the driving force to usher them to a lost condition of believing a lie that heart that is allowed to linger in worldly pleasures can quickly become the most dangerous tool the devil ever has had in his repertoire you better keep that heart tender you better keep that heart pure you better guard that heart (laughs) hallelujah does anybody know what I'm talking about that voice that used to speak to you about certain hobbies no longer exists Because you've allowed it to linger in unholy atmospheres. Hey, sir. Hey, sir. What about lingering in unholy places? Let me tell you about a once righteous preacher that lingered in the wrong place. His name is Lot. Lot? Why did you go to Sodom? God thought enough of Lot and his pastor that God sent sent two angels to rescue Lot and his family. But the Bible says in Genesis 19 and verse number 16 that while the angels had a hold of Lot's arm, Pastor Marin, while the angels had a hold of Lot's arm, that Lot lingered. You might say, hey, Lot, what happened? How'd you go from being a righteous preacher to being a man that will have sexual relations with your own daughter? I'll tell you how. When you allow your heart to linger in unholy atmospheres, when you allow your heart to linger in sin, when you allow your heart to linger in carnality, when you let your heart linger in places that you are never intended to be, you will become hard-hearted and that hard heart will always lead to silent hearts. I said, when you linger in certain places, it will always, will always become silent hearts. And when that heart is silent, I don't care how much preaching you hear. I don't care how much conviction preaching you hear. I don't care if Bishop Doug White is preaching. When your heart becomes silent, it doesn't move you. I don't care if it's your pastor preaching. When you've allowed your heart to become hardened to carnality, to sinful natures, to sinful attitudes, there isn't a preacher that can move you. So I'm warning you, someone here today, you better better keep that heart tender keep that heart pure Lot Lot how did you come to live in Sodom Lot what was the place because you can read in Genesis chapter 12 verse number 4 That when Abram left, the Bible says that Lot went with Abram. But you read it in the very next verse of Genesis 12 and 5. The Bible says, and Abram took Lot. What went from a will, what went there means something that's willing, uh, something that was wanting to go, uh, but took there means uh, he had to be coerced. Uh, he had to be forcefully to, forced to finish the journey. Uh, it was somewhere along the line uh, of that journey from one verse to the next uh, and his heart became hardened uh, to the journey, uh, to things that was taking place. Uh, I don't know what it could have been, uh, but somewhere along the lines, uh, he allowed his heart to become hardened and that is why he was willing to choose the plains of Jordan 
Come on, church. We can fill our lives with politics and drama and social media and outside activities. We will only be able to hear the noise of that. But our heart has become so silent that we have caused our heart to be so hardened by life that we have a silent, a silent heart. You know why some of you can't move? Why some of you ain't moved in a long time? You've allowed your heart to live in perpetual carnality. Come on, I'm home. I'm, I'm, I'm a little different here than I am everywhere else. But you better warn. You better hear this warning tonight. You better listen to your heart. You better get to a place. Oh, I want to ask somebody, how long has it been since you was hearing your pastor preach that you couldn't take it any longer and you staggered to an altar and say, God, let my heart speak to me again. How long has it been since you didn't have to have the musicians to pump and prime you, but it was your heart telling you to worship. It was your heart telling you to get involved. It was your heart telling you to pray. It it was your heart. <laughs> I was eating a couple. I was eating. I can't remember the day. I believe it was one day last week. I was eating with Pastor Long, Bishop Blakely, and Elder Bishop Holmes. Bishop Holmes said, <clears throat> Brother Travis, there's one guy that everywhere I go and I can think of it, I've got to tell his story. And I was already working on this message, but it, it pierced my heart, Pastor Marin. He was preaching. He was preaching. Bishop Holmes, if you know him, he's got a very deep voice. He's a very deep voice, very humble man, very praying man. He was sitting there and he's telling me, he said, Brother, Brother Travis, I've never told you the story, so you've got to endure it today. He said, I'm going to tell you about Roy Bates. He said, Roy Bates is one soul that I wish I could have reached, but I never could. He said, we was, I was there when we first took over as pastor. He said, I was preaching to him, I was preaching to him, I was preaching to him. But his life was such a, like a yo-yo. He'd be up today, down tomorrow, up today, down tomorrow. I could never get him to be faithful to church. I could never get him to be there for prayer. He said, but one day I was preaching about hell. And I went back there and I told Roy Bates, Roy Bates, you better get right tonight. And he looked at me with, audacity, with such audacity. He said, he said, Brother Holmes, I've got to get some stuff right first. I'll be back later. Brother Holmes told him, he said, I'll be here till midnight waiting on you to pray. He said, Brother Travis, I never heard from him again. He said, and the Sunday came. He said, I still hadn't heard from Roy Bates. <clears throat> he said, but I preached that morning after service. Roy, Roy Bates' mama called me. He said, I'm thankful that w nothing was found out until she had that Sunday morning service. He said, because she got a touch and she danced all over the place. But after service, the cops showed up and said, Hey, we got a, I can't remember the mama's name, but it's Roy Bates' mama. He said, The cops came and said, Hey, we found the body of Roy Bates. He went to some house and he had to try to make things right with some people that was doing drugs. And he said them people got Roy Bates and tied him to a tree and took log chains and beat him until he was dead. And then after he was dead, they grabbed him by the ankles with, a, with those same chains and drove him all the way throughout the city of Little Rock down the back roads. And then after that, they took that same big truck and they drove over him and over him and over him and over him again. I don't know how anybody could understand that, but how could you leave a pastor begging you to repent? How could you leave someone not... 
Come on, somebody, you got to hear me today. It was someone that had a silent heart. They couldn't understand, and they couldn't feel the conviction power of God anymore. It was a hard-hearted person. Church, raise your hands. God's wanting to draw somebody tonight. He Come on, how hard have you let your heart get? How hard have you let your heart get? How long have you let your heart linger in unholy atmospheres? How long have you let your heart be in that perpetual carnality? Oh, come on, somebody pray. I said pray. You better find your place and let your heart to become tender again. You better get that heart connected to the throne of heaven until you can hear it speak to you. Oh, you Come on, church. I know you know how to pray. I wish you would pray. Raise your hands. Come on, how long have you went without your heart speaking? How long have you went without your heart speaking to you? In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, in the name of Jesus. I'm trying to hasten to a close here. Oh, in the name of Jesus. The only thing that I can find in my study life experiences that can take a heart from sincerity to hypocrisy as they've allowed their heart to stay in carnal things for far too long. And that heart became so hardened because of carnal things that it became a silent heart. I'm studying about this and I came across, I was trying to do some studying on hearts. And I came across the story of Rene Lenek. I, I, I forgive me for not pronouncing his name right, but he was a doctor. He said he wanted to help people, and he was a French physician. And in 1816, Rene Lenek, he created, invented the first stethoscope. The medical community was so very happy because now they could help others by hearing what, what's going on in the inside of other people and other human bodies. His verse invention of the stethoscope was basically a hardened piece of wood with a cup apparatus on the end of it so he could take it and listen to somebody else's heart. The, the community was so inspired. I mean, in time, that thing, you think about it, church, that stethoscope became the most important tool in every doctor's bag. But at the age of 45 years old, Rene Lenek died of tuberculosis. The medical community, according to the story that I read, said his demise only came because he was so he was in such a remote location that the tool that he invented to help everybody else in their heart and their lungs was so hard that he couldn't he couldn't maneuver it to listen to his own I said he couldn't maneuver come on church he couldn't maneuver it to listen to his own heart Come on, somebody, how long has it been since you've listened to your own heart? Has bitterness got you so hard? 
that you can't even hear your own heart beat anymore? Has carnal issues been gotten your heart so hard that you can't even hear your own heart talk? Oh, you kayarorobosi. Come on, TAC. How long has it been since you've listened to your heart? Is really is that is that thing that's so important that it consumes you? That unforgiveness. That family drama. That cares of life. That career path. Them friends. As it became such an important issue that you can't even hear your own heartbeat. Come on, let's all stand. I'm, I'm done. I have more to say. I skipped a bunch. Come on, somebody. How long has it been since you've heard your heart? Come on, I wish I, wish I didn't have to ask one soul to an altar. But I'm asking you. I wish you would come and get plugged in today. Can you hear your heart today or has it become so hardened? Have you left your heart in places that it's no longer tender to the things of God? Thanks for taking the time to take in today's message from Truth Apostolic Church in Madisonville, Kentucky. Want more? Be sure to like and subscribe. See you next time.